All right, we are recording. So welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of, um, out of your day to join us um, for this webinar. So my name is Libby, for those of you who don't know me, and Carolina is here as well, Carolina Lukak. She's waving her hand if you can see her. Um, uh, we both work for the Vermont Community Garden Network. I'm gonna turn on my lights so you can see me a little better. Oh, maybe. Um, we both work for the Vermont Community Garden Network, uh, which is a statewide nonprofit supporting the growth of community-based um, gardens. We help people grow where they live, learn, work, and play, um, focusing on communal growing spaces and, and how to manage them. Um, and our webinar today, just a kind of a quick agenda overview. Um, so our theme is uh, gardening with purpose. Um, and with a focus on community gardens. Um, and, and by community gardens, we mean um, everything from school gardens, um, plot-based gardens, communal gardens, workplace gardens, anytime people are growing together, um, that's kind of our focus for today. Um, and we'll be looking at that concept of purpose and, and what purpose does your garden serve um, in your community? How does that purpose affect the people that you involve, um, the activities that take place and the space itself? And how do you hone that purpose a little bit more? Um, and we'll, we'll dig into that in just a little bit. Um, we will focus on both lasting strategies, so things that we wanna be thinking about anytime, um, and definitely dive into, all right, we're in a unique situation now, how do we address that? Um, we also will be looking through some of our COVID-19 guidelines um, for safe community gardening and just talking through some of what, what we can do out there and, and what we can't, what we need to be thinking through a little differently. Just to let you know, those of you who are um, in the early care or school world, we do, um, did two other webinars early this, earlier this week and we recorded both of those um, and they will be available on our website along with this recording, um, but before the end of the week. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so I did a little bit already, but those of you who joined a little bit later, feel free to um, enable your video function. We'd love to see your face if your face is available <laughs> and you have that function. Um, we are muting everybody for right now, but we will, there's potential to unmute you at some point and we'd love to hear your voices. Um, in fact, I would just say, we wanna hear from you in this webinar. Um, I will be doing some presenting, um, but I also really hope to, um, to hear both questions and ideas from you all. That will be um, an important part of making this a robust experience for everybody. Um, so uh, a couple of functions. Um, I already mentioned that you can rename yourself, turn on your video, um, screen view. So up in the right hand corner, you can either click speaker view, which just means that you can just see me or whomever else is speaking. Um, and there's also a grid view should be another option there. And that's where you see everybody's faces um, or their name if their face isn't on there. The other function, and I would say this is one of the most important functions, is the chat function. Um, and we will ask you to use this, like I said, as much as possible. Um, so that's on the bottom of your screen. There's a little button that says chat. You can click that. Um, if you have topic related questions or resources you want to share, um, we highly encourage that. And um, you want to just chat to everyone. There's like a little drop down that says who you want to chat to. You just want to chat to everyone. And in fact, I see that there's someone that's utilizing it that says, hi, everyone from Uta. Thank you, Uta. Um, and, uh, and then for more technical questions, troubleshooting, or if you wanna speak and don't have a video function where you can wave and let us know that you wanna speak, um, that you wanna just chat to Carolina Lukek only, um, and she will, um, she will unmute you and get things going. We will have a few question and answer pauses throughout, and then we'll have a big section at the end um, for us to really just dive into questions, answers, and, and um, just ideas that are out there. Uh, and we also, just a note, we will follow up with links. So there, the chat function, um, all of that discussion will be, um, will be available when you, at, in the video recording. Um, but uh, we also will have a version of the slideshow that will, that will um, include uh, links that we've talked about during this time. So don't feel like you have to like scramble and figure out what all those links are. We'll make sure you get those. So one thing to note, one other housekeeping piece, is that I live in Winooski and jets fly overhead. So it could get noisy occasionally. It seems like it's getting noisy right now. So my apologies, <laughs> the, the story of this kind of technology and um, interacting right now. 
Um, so while we're, while we're working through that, um, if people want to go ahead and play around with the chat function and type in um, where you are coming from, so your, your location, and if you are representing a garden, what the name of your garden is. We would love just to hear from you. And we can share that out, just a quick share out. All right, so we have the folks from Montpelier at the Garden at 485 Elm. Hey, Cheryl, how's it going? Nancy from um, the North Branch Nature Center Community Garden. Excellent, also in the Montpelier area. Glover, Vermont. Um, and, um, oh, the Community Garden in, in Barton that's um, starting. West Lebanon, New Hampshire, excellent. White River Junction, VA Greenhouse. Duxbury Community Garden over in Waterbury. Waterbury area, I should say. Um, Essex Junction Community Garden, a couple different folks from there. Um, Star Farm, so, um, so he, that's in the Burlington area here, Heinsburg. Excellent, we've got some folks from, from different parts of the state. Great, great to have you, Montpelier area, Abenaki territory, wonderful. All right, so keep on, keep on typing and keep on sharing and keep on asking questions. Um, we are going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and dive into that, um, that those COVID-19 guidelines um, that I had, I had mentioned. Um, and uh, um, but like I said, keep putting your questions in there, and then we'll come back for a chance to to share and ask. All right, all good, Carolina. Okay, wonderful. So. Um, so as many of you probably know, um, at Vermont Community Garden Network, we developed uh, COVID-19 guidelines for safe community gardening. Um, and, and that's based on CDC guidelines um, and loads of um, really smart thinking and really great ideas from folks from all over the country um, to, that helped develop those guidelines. We do continue to update them as well as the resources that are on the bottom of that page. So something just to kind of keep going back to, um, you can locate it um, just on the, our front page is on the scroll you click learn more and um, you can you can go ahead and read those and you can also download um, a copy that you can print out at your garden if you're interested in that so um, we're not going to go through every single guideline right here um, but I did want to highlight some things that I think will be important for our conversation uh, and I would just before I dive in I want to just say I think that the probably two most important pieces of this are just to be thinking ahead which by coming on to this webinar um, I see that you all are thinking ahead about how what is, what is our strategy um, and how we're going to be safe about this and then staying safe um, kind of a, a when in doubt um, uh, mantra um, that, that stay safe is really the most important thing we can be doing right now so starting with social distancing, I'm not going to say a whole lot new about this. It's what everyone's um, saying already, the six feet between yourself and other gardeners. Um, bring a mask to wear when other gardeners, other people are in the garden. Um, and the CDC provides guidelines on this and um, how to make a mask with household items. And that's all linked to in our guidelines there. Um, related to that, scheduling, um, scheduling shifts and dividing up tasks I think it's a big question a lot of community gardeners are having right now. Um, I first want to start this by saying, um, if possible, um, and if it makes sense for your garden, um, consider waiting to open the garden, a garden to gardeners um, as late as is reasonable as we work to flatten the curve of the virus. Uh, obviously, stay tuned to governor announcements and on the CDC website, um, but uh, definitely something to be thinking about. Um, it's not too late to plant. I know we're used to planting a lot of, um, a lot of things before now, um, uh, but we might just need to think about the season a little differently. So that's one thing I want to, we want to just kind of encourage people um, to think about starting um, with, with groups of gardeners um, uh, uh, later than usual. Um, in terms of scheduling, thinking about um, scheduling small groups of gardeners um, who can be easily spaced. So thinking about kind of your garden as a grid and how you can space out gardeners um, in smaller groups, um, especially when you're looking at you know, work days and things like that. Um, and then scheduling for shifts within that. Um, 
we it hasn't said you know the idea of of um, ha being there on site or someone being there on site to oversee those work days um, can be a really helpful thing, especially as people are getting used to these new ways of interacting in the space um, and paying attention to sanitization and all of that. You'll want to make sure you schedule at least a half an hour break, if not more, um, between those groups of gardeners to wipe down shared surfaces, and we'll talk about how to do that in just a second here. So in terms of disinfecting, um, a few things I want to note. The first um, that I think is, is probably the most important thing we've all heard, hand washing is the best thing we can do very right now. So setting up a hand washing station at your garden um, at the entrance slash exit uh, is a really great idea. Um, we have make it yourself instructions. Um, on those guidelines and then I also actually just added on our website um, a, a link to a foot pump um, camping hand wash station that someone sent me um, that is another kind of um, hands-free situation um, that you could purchase for a kind of a more permanent hand washing station in your garden um, and then Hand sanitizer is sort of like a secondary piece, but if you at some point don't have water, um, uh, it's a hard thing to find right now. Um, there is a, a group, and that, this is also in the guidelines right now, um, I think a silo distillery is offering um, free hand sanitizer, 12 ounces per person, if you can pick it up in person. Um, so something to note, um, inventorying all areas of the garden where people commonly come into contact is the next thing you want to be thinking about. Um, so that would be probably a lot of different spots, but the particularly spigots, hose, handles, gates, um, and then if you have shared tools or um, garden carts, that kind of thing, um, making sure you pay attention to those things, um, making sure you have some good signage up um, in those areas. Um, you know, someone mentioned potentially if it's a safe thing to do, leave your garden gate open so people don't have to think about opening and closing that, um, at least for your, during your workday times. Um, so just being conscious of those areas in particular. Um, bringing disinfectant, and especially for those, again, in between when different people are using the garden, but also um, for a good, good recommendation for individuals um, to wipe down anything that you touch that someone else might touch. Um, so those tools, those shared surfaces, that kind of thing. So if the surface is visibly dirty, you want to wash it first with soap and water, um, and then uh, you can make your own disinfectant, five tablespoons spoons of bleach per gallon of water. All of this is on our guidelines. Um, you want to leave the solution on the surface for at least one minute um, and use paper towels and dispose of them. Um, even though we don't like to waste in our gardens, um, that is an important practice to be disposing of anything that's coming into contact with, with those um, during that disinfection process. It's always a good practice to wear gloves, but gloves um, do not replace proper disinfection um, procedures. So the outside of the glove can still transmit diseases. Um, so wear, when you wear those gloves, uh, wash them after use and between uses. And then something we're also not used to in the community gardening world, limiting sharing sharing of tools, equipment, that kind of thing. Uh, we would highly encourage you to close off your, your um, shared tool um, storage shed if possible. Um, remove all community shared tools and equipment for the time being, um, just while we're really figuring this thing out. Um, if that is what you choose to do, um, there are some alternatives we've been discussing with different people. Um, assigning tools and associated tasks to specific gardeners for the season. So some of those bigger tools that you really only need a couple times a season, um, that might be a good thing for just certain people to focus on. Um, asking gardeners to bring their own tools, obviously, is the, is the easiest thing to do. Not always possible. People can't always bring tools or afford them. Um, so considering you're asking your community for tool donations for individual use, um, I think you'll be surprised by what you'll, what you'll hear from folks. Obviously, proper disinfection procedures when accepting donations is important. And then if you are sharing your produce or using it in meals, practicing food safety is just always a good thing to do. Um, there's no evidence that COVID-19 is passed on through food. Um, thorough cooking will kill the virus. Um, but uh, if you're sharing um, with others, just proceed with extra caution. And we do have some guidelines around that in, a, in, our, in our guidelines and links to um, food safety. Um, encouraging people to leave food and drink out of the garden as much as possible. Again, something we're not used to. We've got to just think about a little bit differently, we just reducing the amount of hand to mouth kind of situation. And then when in doubt, stay home. We all know that that rule, we're all abiding by it at this point in time. Um, so uh, 
so yeah, it applies to the garden as well, volunteering and and uh, and otherwise. So I'm going to stop my share um, for a few minutes here, and um, give you all just a chance for for this section um, to ask any questions specifically about the guidelines. Um, we will get into more specific strategies. Um, we'll kind of weave those into the next part of the presentation. So really, uh, my question for you right now is just any questions about the guidelines, any concerns about it, um, anything that came up, Carolina, in the chat. Yes, we have one question. Cheryl is asking, any concerns about using bleach solution around the garden near plants? That's a great question. Um, I haven't heard that question yet, Cheryl. I'll owe it to you to, <laughs> to ask those sorts of questions. Um, so um, I haven't heard that concern. I think I, I think it's a worthwhile concern, though. I think probably when you're using that bleach solution, keeping it away from the plants themselves is probably a good idea. So it'd be more for your surfaces um, as much as possible. Carolina, do you have any feedback on that or any thoughts? I've definitely thought about it. I haven't figured out a great solution. I appreciate that we're all going to be wearing masks so that I don't have to inhale bleach fumes. I'm just as concerned about my own belongings getting bleached as the plants getting damaged. I'm setting up a designated tool sanitizing area that is in the border of the garden so that if bleach gets somewhere, it's in one designated spot where there's no edible plants growing is what my approach is going to be. I think that's an excellent idea. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think having, um, again, having signage um, and having sort of stations where it's it just, um, I think it gets noticed more too, rather than just being kind of a willy nilly wherever um, kind of situation, uh, I, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Any other, any comments on that or other questions? There is another question from Nancy. Why do you not have the responsibility to do hand washing and sanitation as you leave the garden? Thank you, Nancy, for catching that one. <laughs> um, I just didn't mention it, <laughs> but but I think it's actually a really good idea. We're kind of by my brain, and I think a lot of our brains are kind of on the what's happening when you're in the garden side of things. But absolutely, um, our responsibility is well beyond that. Um, so that's I think that's why that hand washing station is a great idea to have it at that at that location, so that uh, and and a sign that says please wash your hands as you enter and before you leave. So thank you for bringing that up, Nancy. A couple other. Jean is asking, what about shared things like chips, compost, et cetera? So um, they're actually, so wood chips is a great question. I think um, the actual contamination of the wood chips, I would be less concerned about. It would be more the tools that would be used to um, for sharing them would be my would be my thoughts about that. Um, compost, we actually did just get some guidance from um, from CAV from the Composting Association of Vermont, um, and I've just added that also to that page. It's on the it's on the bottom part of the resource section there. Um, and uh, basically, what they're saying is that uh, compost when it sits over time. Hot temperatures are the best, obviously, kills, kills lots of things. Um, but even um, if you're not getting way up to those temperatures, if you're letting the compost sit, you don't have to worry so much about it um, in terms of the actual compost in, you know, being an issue for infection. However, <laughs> managing your compost, you do have to be concerned about those sorts of things. So um, thinking about what you're, what you're adding into that compost. So again, like not putting things like your paper towels where people wash their hands in there um, uh, or other things that would be, that could have some contamination on them. Um, just being really careful about that in particular in terms of what you add to the compost. Um, compost lids are another piece of that. Um, that would be another one of those shared surfaces. And honestly, what I would encourage, and I've, I've heard a few gardens doing this is, um, Either, well, if you have the option, if there's not food in your compost system, keeping those lids open is one thing I've heard. Um, but if you are, if it's a more managed sort of system and you have things where you need to make sure that lid stays on, having a core group that's really in charge of managing that and adding to that and really not allowing anybody else near that area. So that kind of like that, that disinfection sort of procedure that happens between groups that like a site coordinator, or someone who's in charge um, does that. Uh, I would say the same thing for, um, for your compost management. So um, fewer, the fewer people um, there being really careful about hand washing, um, and sanitizing tools and all of that after, before and after. 
yeah, that'd be my feedback on that. And they actually, and I would highly encourage you to check out that resource because that's my two cents related to what I read on there, but they actually have a whole um, kind of thought process of like, well, if you have this, then what would you do in this situation? They have a, it's a really helpful, helpful tool for compost. Hopefully that answered your question around compost. Libby, I'm going to unmute Nancy. She has a follow-up question and it might be helpful for her to be able to let us know everything that's on her mind. Great. So Nancy, I am, you are unmuted if you want to share your question again and any other thoughts. Yeah, I only bring this on. I'm an emergency room doctor and I do a lot of, you know, work around educating people in terms of how to stay healthy in this coronavirus time. And I'm so glad that we all are taking it incredibly seriously. And I think the bottom line is the most important thing is to, as you've all heard a hundred times, don't touch your face and wash your hands before you do anything and wash your hands when you're done with doing everything. So I wanna just put the analogy of when you go shopping as if we are going to the garden. When you go shopping, you are not sanitizing everything you touch nor when you leave. And I think that that responsibility to be able to go to the garden, put your gloves on, use shared tools, your garden gloves are covered in dirt, you already have to wear your mask at all times in the garden. So if you cough and sneeze, you're not getting the garden tools dirty. So I'm just saying we have our community garden meeting coming up and our group has thought in terms of this sort of thing to feel like we can clean the tools. They've been all winter. So on some level, you don't really need to clean the tools that no one's touched yet and allow the, you know, as a doctor, I say risk benefit. So the benefit of all the things that community sharing does and the, the risk, you know, there's, there's no way people are going to bring their own tools to our garden. Um, a lot of them don't have them. We have 60 people in our plot. Our plots are all 20 by 20. So the six foot distancing when you're in your own plot, you clearly need to space out if you're parking and walking, but the reality of having run this garden for 20 years is they are rarely more than two or three people in the entire, you know, 150 by 300 foot garden. So it's not like we're not social distancing as we garden and people are out walking the perimeter of the North Branch Nature Center with their six feet. You know, people are walking their dogs are walking a lot closer than our gardening. So I'm just trying to have a reality check and just sharing what we're thinking in our garden and my concern to have a Vermont organization that's, you know, very respected as you all are putting out guidelines where we can't do what we are thinking of doing without contradicting or going against your Vermont guidelines. So um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you for all of that. Um, and I would say, um, so our guidelines are guidelines, like as always, right? So we're sort of like based on the conversations that have been been happening. Um, we're just we're putting out what we feel like is sort of the best information we can, helping people think about all the possible possible things because not everyone's in a situation like you. Some of these spaces are a little bit closer together. Um, there are kids in some of these spaces where there's the caution is a little bit um, it's harder to control. <laughs> um, so so it's kind of a it's the it's a bigger picture guidelines. Um, I would encourage you all to look at it that way. <laughs> um, uh, what I think is important, and you pointed this out, Nancy, is that you're having that conversation as an individual garden. Um, that if you're, you know, just making a decision as a as one individual in that garden, I think that that's more problematic. Um, but if you're having those discussions. Um, and you know, like this is the nature of our garden and this is what works and we know that people are going to be responsible for these reasons and um, we know that they can't bring <laughs> their own tools for these reasons. Um, I, I, as long as you're thinking those things through, that would be, that would be my two cents about that. Um, I appreciate you bringing that up though. But yeah, got, there definitely are guidelines um, based on what we're hearing on, in the bigger picture. And um, I think we, we definitely, um, went on the side of being overly cautious. I mean, as you, I think as people often do, anytime they're putting out guidelines is to, um, is rather than going under, going a little over um, was important for us. Carolina, anything that you would add to that? No. Okay. Um, any other just last few questions before we dive into the next piece? There's one question that I'll ask you, Libby. How does, uh, Uta is asking how to sanitize water hoses and taps. 
So it would be with that bleach solution um, using a paper towel or some other kind of wipe. Um, and you just want to make sure it's, it's kind of stays wet ish. You, know, you kind of like really douse it for like, um, and stays on there for a minute before you wiping that off. Um, or just leaving it. Uh, that's, that's what I've heard. So hopefully that, that answers your question. All right. All right, so keep your questions and, and ideas coming. Um, I am gonna dive into the other portion of our, um, of our talk here today. So we have, we have time for it. I wanna make sure I get to that. Oh, awesome. So share screen. And thank you for your many questions. This is what makes this, um, this a robust conversation. So appreciated. So as for our theme today, so gardening with purpose. Um, so I, let's see, in terms of time, I might actually just kind of speed ahead, but I do want you all to, I was gonna have you give a chance to kind of talk about some of your purpose, but I think we're I'm just gonna have you just think about that a little bit right now. Um, you know, why do you have or want um, a, a garden in your community? What purpose does it serve is sort of the question that we're starting with. Um, and I'm just gonna let you kind of just think about that, hold that in your head a little bit um, as we move forward. Um, so this question, and if you've ever been to a workshop with me or spent any time with, with me, you've probably heard me like a broken record because I think this is one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves, not just as we're starting out with a community garden, but, um, but throughout our time in the garden. Um, uh, it's, you know, what, what is our purpose? It's foundational to designing the right garden for your community, helping you to determine um, how your garden will be used, your, your programs, your activities, um, who you engage in the process. Um, and I want to recognize that, that that can shift at any point in time, um, that purpose, and always to be paying attention to kind of, you might have kind of a bigger idea of like, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it, um, but that might change by, you know, some of your goals and your purpose might change by season. Um, and this season is no exception um, in, a, in a major way. Um, our, many of our goals are, could be shifting in light of the COVID-19 outbreak, um, both based on what's possible for some of us, um, priorities might be a little bit different than they are than they have been in the past, um, and needs are also different for a lot of um, our residents and gardeners. So, um, in the next little piece here, we'll be looking at general strategies, but also strategies that will continue to be effective during this um, this time of social distancing and, and thinking about how to operate. So, first, I want us just to think briefly about who are you trying to reach. Um, it may be obvious. Uh, it may be connected to your mission if you're an organization or the access that you have to a given group of people, um, like for organizations, your focus is probably your constituents, um, you know, related to your mission, um, what you're trying to do, schools and educational facilities, um, your focus is likely students and families, businesses, employees, or clients that you serve. Um, and then community gardens, we, got, we have a much broader category um, of residents often. Um, but I want to also emphasize that you, you may also, whether it's now or at other points in time, um, be hoping to reach out beyond your usual boundaries to serve a different group of people for a different purpose. Um, one example that I think is, would be salient right now is um, a school garden that's lying unused uh, might gather volunteers to grow food for those in need, um, during, especially during and following this current crisis. It's definitely a story I've been hearing here and there. Um, so always being open to that kind of that possibility to, to shift and be nimble. So the next question is, how will you serve them? This is where we get at the purpose side of things. Uh, I'm not going to go through this whole list because that's, that's the next portion of my presentation. Um, but I just want to emphasize, you know, these are some kind of big ideas, um, but um, purpose, but um, how do we think about some simple, simple and creative um, solutions to put that purpose into action? So education, I think, is a big, big piece for um, gardens of all sorts, um, teaching skills and concepts. So we have our classic workshops. Skill swaps is something that um, I hear at some community gardens um, and, and, and other types of gardens where um, community gardeners can actually, you know, I have something to offer, you have something to offer. Um, let's, uh, you know, present on that or to each other or have a, you know, kind of an informal learning session around that. Obviously, if you're in an educational setting, incorporating into the curriculum is a big piece of that. Um, there are loads of resources out there for that purpose. Um, 
uh, an excellent resource at any point in time um, or for, for these educational pieces is UVM Mas Extension Master Gardener. Um, they uh, you know, can do one-time um, workshops and educational kind of support. Um, but they also, they've been doing a lot of efforts and I think I saw Brett on this, on this, um, on this call as well. Um, so if you have any chiming in to do it at some point, Brett, we'd love to hear from you more. Um, they are, um, they're also kind of stepping up and they've, they've created this Vermont Victory Over Virus Vegetable Gardening Resource Map. Um, and the idea here, and my understanding, is that um, you don't have to be a master gardener um, to be included in the map. You just have to be someone who knows something about gardening or has tools to offer or has um, some sort of skills to offer to this, um, the cause of gardening. Um, what a great resource for um, keeping the kind of the education up and going um, and other kind of resource sharing going in your garden. Another, another uh, great way to get at that teaching skills and concepts um, is demo plots um, to promote gardening practices, which often are used in sort of, um, that, kind of that educational um, kind of workshops and other things like that. A great way to use those spaces right now is really to think about what kind of signage can you have throughout your garden or in those demo plots um, that will help uh, to, you know, whether it's showing people how something's harvested um, or whether it's, uh, you know, talks about a particular particular technique like a no-till garden, um, uh, square foot gardening, um, a little lesson on that um, via signage, um, posting materials on site that can help teach about some of these things. So there's a lot we can do. Um, as you'll see, I put a little, um, in parentheses, a little uh, COVID-19 piece where I feel like these are practices we can continue um, to do and, and think creatively about in this next while. Um, some resources around that. Um, we I did a tool shed tip. I'm very passionate about signage. So I did a tool shed tip a little while ago that highlights um, some things to think about around signage and has some great examples out there. Um, and then also that encouragement to post those guidelines that we've created or creating your own, an, a version of your own that, um, that will be useful for your garden community, um, making sure you, you have those up in the garden so people can continue to um, have that on the top of their minds. Right now, thinking about what's the what's some remote sharing that we can do, and um, I know that there are a number of groups that have done a really great job with either they have an email list that works really well for their group, um, Facebook, you know, kind of closed Facebook groups, Google groups. Um, these are all different tools I've I've actually heard garden groups be really successful with. But you know, you want to think about your own unique audience and and what they will use, um, especially right now um, for depending on what you you've chosen to do in terms of opening your garden. If you can't open it quite yet. Um, there's, you know, potentially this could be a great way to kind of keep people connected, um, excited, and informed um, about uh, what they what they can be doing around gardening, what can they, they can be preparing for. And then this is kind of another outside idea, um, the remote engagement and actually in activities. Um, so things that could happen outside of the garden. Um, so one example I wanted to give, um, I recently was sent to me by Barton Community Garden. Um, uh, so they're, they're starting a new garden in, in Barton and they've actually um, have sent some, some press releases um, and are doing, putting some articles in the newspaper. I think the idea is to do kind of a series. Um, they had initially planned on, um, I think, doing some in-person um, like garden dreaming activities and some other educational activities with folks in their community. Well, instead they're doing it via their local newspaper, which is something that people read in their community and that, um, that works for that connection. Um, and for this particular, the last one, this one particular one, the Barton Community Garden Committee invites you to dream, create, and share your garden dreams. And so there's actually an activity around um, doing that, both informing their process, but also helping people kind of start to plan their gardens and think about that sort of thing. And then for those of you who are working with kids and families, um, has sending home activity ideas for families. And even if, if you're in a community garden, um, that could also be a great tool. There are some great resources out there, Kids Gardening, and that um, has loads of tips. Um, and then Junior Master Gardener actually has been doing these virtual meets um, that I think like are 20 minutes each and you can just jump on and it's a great way, um, great way to get a little bit of gardening information. And I just want to say one more thing about this before we open it back up for, for some of that um, discussion. So um, related to education is this concept of collective action um, for, for the greater good, sort of a call to action. Um, and you know, you know, it's really around what are, um, what are some of those big ideas, you know, things like 
climate change or um, you know pollinator habitat or um, other things that we're you know water conservation things that we're concerned about um, that we can be doing practice wise in the garden um, and both both practicing and, and doing doing good collectively but also teaching about those particular practices so things like no-till gardening demo plots and pollinator habitat um, of various kinds like bee boxes and um, and uh, rain barrels and um, all kinds of different options. Uh, a resource I just as recently discovered from Cornell um, is Gardening in a Warming World, which has everything from curriculum for all ages um, to just some tips on um, climate friendly gardening, which I think are really useful as well. So I'm going to take another little pause here. And, um, and my question for you all, um, kind of based on this last section we've talked about, so how will your group continue to offer education and promote collective action um, during this unusual season? Um, I'd love to hear any questions you have about that or creative ideas that your particular group is working with or resources as well. And if anybody wants to speak, so you can use the chat function as a part of that, or if anybody wants to speak, just raise your hand if I, we can see you. If we can't see you, <laughs> um, then just type to Carolina that you would like to speak and we'll make sure you get unmuted. I don't see any questions, but I think folks who are looking at the chat have seen there's been some, some sharing of ideas. Um, whether it's signs or how great gratitude signs and then Sean sharing that one of their activities suggests using Minecraft to design a garden to target kids. I was going to type in that one resource that I like for online garden design that anyone can do from home is Grow Veg. I really like the program. It's there's a free trial. Um, I'll type it in there, but it's another online garden design program that folks that are interested in digital programs could have fun with it. And I, I consider it friendly for all ages. Awesome. I just saw the, the, um, uh, the back and forth between um, Carolina, you and Cheryl, um, the idea of gratitude signs. What a nice idea um, and something that we could all use right now and be thinking about right now. And I saw the link that you, um, or image that you added of gratefulness rocks. <laughs> Oh, and I see your Grow Veg link. Awesome. Any other any other thoughts around this idea of um, continuing to make education um, happen in the garden during this unusual season, or any other questions that have popped up for you in the meantime? Otherwise, we'll get back to the presentation. I have one question. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to I teach a gardening class my students will be at home for the first few weeks and I'm trying to figure out how to share the garden with them we do not have reliable internet at the garden um, so if anybody has any thoughts on kind of how to do live coverage of a garden um, ways of videoing what's happening in the garden or capturing what's in the garden and then sharing it digitally with your fellow community members, I'd love to hear. So one thing I'll mention, Carolina, I know we've talked about this a little bit um, while other folks are thinking, is uh, I know that with some of the school gardens that I've had conversations with, um, that they are doing for their, um, for their kids that are not gonna be back at school this year, um, to keep them in touch with the, with the community garden, they're, taking, they're doing sort of like a um, video and photo log um, of what's happening in the garden at different points, different weeks. I think they're doing like a week by week sort of thing. Um, so a, kind of like a little video log journal kind of situation. Um, it's kind of a fun way to get at that and, and sharing that with folks. So Nancy mentioned that um, uh, phone video works offline. So yeah, so there's, we have some great, um, great tools that are right at our fingertips <laughs> as far as that goes. So some other, are you reading them? There'll be some other folks chiming in there as well. Yeah, do you mind, do you mind sharing that out? 
So Amanda is sharing that part of our garden intention is how growing food and community is part of undoing white supremacy. So we will be doing various ancestral connection, lineage work, as well as trying to connect with local Abenaki struggles. Wonderful. And I'd love to hear, Amanda, a little bit more um, how you're doing in the, that in this unique season. Are there any strategies that you're, um, that you're doing to make that work uh, without necessarily all being there together? And, is it okay if I unmute you? Or maybe you I just unmuted her. So Amanda, you, you are <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're still kind of figuring out what that looks like, but part of it has been um, a lot more intention and attention to our community growers about where their lineage is from and looking at growing specific plants connected to those lineages, um, as well as we'll have have to figure out what um, kind of like ritual or ceremony happens at the garden space and how that can happen. But I think we'll also be doing some various kind of homeworks outside of garden that will be reading various reading resources and um, maybe some various chatty chat chatting things. Very nice. Awesome. Yeah. So kind of doing the collecting now. Um, and that can be shared out. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for sharing. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to, I'm realizing what time it is. We don't have that much time together all in all. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and get through just a little bit more of this. And um, again, uh, keep on, um, keep on sharing. It's great to hear from you all. So, um, the next piece is sort of around access. So obviously providing the space to grow is an important thing for a lot of us. Access to land um, is a big part of that. Um, and, and I think the important question for us to ask ourselves is sort of the, um, the how do we reach those people who, who need, need access? And some of the people are just gonna um, step right up and it's not gonna be an issue at all. But um, I think sometimes, and I've, I've definitely, this is a common issue I've heard in a lot of garden, community gardens um, is, is really finding the people um, and making sure that you connect the resource with the people who, who most need it. So considering accessibility to your site, so um, uh, from uh, how, what distance your site is to um, the population you're trying to reach, um, what kind of transportation there is between your site and where people live and um, spend their time, um, how do they get there, um, you know, thinking about do you need to play a role in getting them there um, or, or do we need to think about um, where our garden's located <laughs> um, in other situations might even be something to think about. Um, accessible, and so once people are there, the accessibility of the site is another um, important piece to, to that part of the access. And so, um, so everything from pathways to raised beds, um, all of that, again, if you're trying to reach, um, reach people, having a sense of, of what they need around those areas. Um, there we have a resource that's, a, again, like kind of our tips and a big collection of some great resources out there around building accessible gardens um, that's worth checking out. Um, and then the how much space do people need? So um, I, I like to think of it as not too much and not too little. Um, I'd say not too much because um, if you give a new gardener a huge space to grow in, um, Chant, that's oftentimes when you see uh, people get discouraged about gardening and um, overwhelmed um, potentially. Um, and so thinking about not too much if you have new, new gardeners, um, not too little if you have people who are used to growing for um, big families um, or for their cultural group, um, uh, you know, thinking, thinking of scaling it in those different ways, um, potentially in one garden or in multiple gardens in your community. And, uh, and then how do people find out? So just paying attention to how people get their information. That's an important piece that I think we're all thinking about right now in, um, as we're doing so much rem remote communication, um, really being, being uh, wise about, um, about knowing how people actually receive their information because it's gonna be different depending on um, people's situation. And then related to that, um, the just opening up that opportunity to be active outside and promoting physical and mental well-being. So making time for it. If you're um, in more of a um, controlled setting like a school or a business, um, building in that into the structure of your day rather than assuming people can make time at any old, any old time. Um, uh, and then making sure your open hours are convenient for the population you're trying to reach as well. Um, uh, you know, thinking about when, when people are available is a big part of that. 
And then increasing access to fresh vegetables, um, I think is probably also on the number one list for a lot of us in terms of purpose um, and really looking at through a health and equity lens. So um, lots of different ideas um, around that. I've, I've heard people get creative around um, in, in the most basic ways, um, you know, thinking about actual donation gardens. I know um, uh, like Barton Community Garden is talking about serving more in that purpose and there are a number of other gardens around the state that really focus on that. Um, the concept of grow a row um, is, uh, you know, gardeners can focus on, you know, uh, individual plot holders can focus on a, a row that they can offer up to food, food shelves or meal programs. Um, uh, communal garden shares, um, the example Example there, um, Fresh Start Community Farm, um, they actually have a, a system where people can volunteer at their garden and depending on how much they volunteer, they can go home with a certain share of vegetables. Um, and so it may be that they only have a little bit of time to offer to the garden or maybe it's even just a one time thing, um, but they get sort of an equal amount of vegetables back as a part of a kind of thank you for being involved and, um, and kind of to keep them connected to that full cycle. Uh, and, um, and a lot of those resources around sharing um, are also available on our website um, on another Toolshed Tips Share the Bounty. So lots of, lots of great resources to help make that happen. So I'm going to bring us back to conversation. And just to ask, um, you know, how will your group continue to address access um, during this unusual season? Um, if people, if you expect for there to be increased issues around, um, around access, um, or um, if there are different ways that you're addressing it because of what the situation that we're in. And whether that's access to land or vegetables or, um, or just the opportunity to, to be outside doing stuff. And again, if you, um, you can either type in the chat or you can raise your hand if you want to share something. Cheryl typed something in and I was wondering, Cheryl, if we unmute you, would you be willing to share in voice? We'd love to hear your voice. Great. You are unmuted. Hi. What did you want to hear? <laughs> the comment that you shared on how you are managing donations and cleaning. Okay. Thanks. Um, since our garden is entirely shared, communally grown, communally harvested, no separate plots for anybody, instead of designating particular rows or boxes for growing for donation, we glean ourselves and also um, our donation coordinator within the garden also volunteers with Community Harvest of Central Vermont. So she connects with them and they come and glean in our garden also for donation. So we're going to continue with those channels, um, though they're all still going along. So we uh, hope to continue it this season. I would love to hear, Cheryl, if you could stay on just for one more minute, um, just if there's, if anybody's brought up any concerns about that that you had to address in terms of, um, of, of sharing vegetables that have been touched by other people and just if anything's come up around that that you've had to address. Since there hasn't been any evidence that food is a vector for virus spread, we haven't felt concerned about that. I admit to a personal um, one it kind of ick factor wondering whether raw vegetables are potentially an issue like salad, you know, salad greens where there's little crevices and things. Um, but uh, I have one of those slightly OCD uh, germophobic things going on from before this anyway. So I don't really know. Um, I think it's okay. Uh, Nancy, nod your head if you think it's okay as long as we wash stuff. <laughs> See, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, we don't know. But we are, anybody getting food from the grocery still has to treat and trust their food in the ways that they already are. The fact that it's coming from the garden to us just means we have to manage our safety in the garden as we are doing now anyway, with masks and with six to 10 feet or more distance and with more high risk households, not in the garden with anyone else at all anyway, and um, regular risk people, or at least as far as they know, um, gardening according to those guidelines when other people are here. No more than five to eight people in the quarter acre fenced garden, everybody six to 10 feet or more apart and wearing masks if there's anybody not of your household in the garden, things like, and sanitizing, things like that. Yeah. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Nancy, is there anything you would add to that? Not to put you on the spot, but. And just nod your head if you would like to be unmuted, we can unmute you. Uh, let's see, I just gotta find you. <laughs> there you go. 
maybe. Might take a minute. I just take your, I'd like to, yeah, perfect. Um, no, I just think that the medical community still does not know a lot. If you think about like the spinach E. coli outbreak uh, five years ago, uh, we do know viruses don't last long on, you know, cardboard is a drying agent. So you buy your cereal and you leave it three days in your uh, little breezeway or garage, you can bring it in and the virus will be dead on that box that you brought in. But I think we don't know enough about moist, wet surfaces because things can live longer. So having worked abroad, having lived in Mexico or places like that where we all know if you, if you buy groceries in a Mexican, any place, you know, if, you, if you're unsure of the food you're getting, you can do a nice dilute bleach of leaving your vegetables for three to five minutes. They say one to two minutes, I say three to five, <laughs> and I. Um, and then just rinse it well with water. It doesn't really change the flavor. So if you want to be careful, uh, you know, bleach does kill this virus. Uh, soap and water is a lousy way to, you know, it bruises vegetables, whatever. So soap is better on your hands, but I think bleach is better for most vegetables. So that's probably about it. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate it. Um, and then I would say just on top of that, and this is always just a good, um, a good practice when you're working with a, a food shelf or a meal site, um, uh, an outside group that you're giving your vegetables to, just having a conversation with them about what their practices are. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna be doing some of that just on their end and you know, putting out whatever precautions they feel like are, are right to do, but, um, but having that conversation with them. Obviously, we do that oftentimes before we even start growing the vegetables just to know what food shelves um, need and want, um, but but similarly, what, what protocol should we follow this season um, would be a great question to ask those sites too. Excellent. Anything else come up, Carolina, before we dive into this last section? No, go ahead. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Really appreciate it. So this last piece, I actually don't have um, don't have that many examples around and um, Cheryl, a little nod to Garden at 45 Elm um, for the picture. Um, so, uh, so building community um, connection, I know, is an important thing for a lot of uh, community gardens, bringing people together, um, creating spaces for gathering, community events, all of these great things um, that are really challenging right now and that we, I think, we've, for, for the time being, we absolutely have to avoid. Um, so what are some things that we can do? And I, I mostly am gonna pose this question back to you. Um, a couple of things I wanna just put out there. Um, and first and foremost is just, continuing to foster, and this is an anytime thing, um, continuing to foster a welcoming environment. Um, so just like um, the gratitude rocks <laughs> and, you know, signs and, you know, things like that that you can do. Um, again, it, it may not, um, uh, you know, people may not get to know each other better necessarily through that um, particular thing, but they can feel like, okay, we're in something together, we're doing something together, and we feel um, this feels like a, um, this, this environment fosters that. Um, and so one example here is from the Garden of 45 Elm. I don't know if you're still doing that, but they were um, from a period of time. I see Cheryl nodding yes, um, uh, posting pictures of all their gardeners um, by their bulletin board. Um, and just a great way to, again, kind of being in a unique situation. Um, uh, this is how you, one way that you make sure you know the people who are in your garden. You see a face and you see the name and you can introduce yourself. And um, we can do that from six foot distance now <laughs> if we need to. Um, but uh, uh, but a great one great way to kind of just put a visual out in the garden um, to help people um, make those some of those connections. And then another thing I want to just put out there, and this is me brainstorming because I'm still figuring some of the stuff out too, is um, are there ways, again, right now when maybe gardens aren't open or you're kind of still tiptoeing into the, into the garden season, um, that we can create an up, kind of upkeep this idea um, that, that those connections through online community. Um, again, I know that's limited for, uh, for some participants and so we want to be aware of that. Um, but if it is a possibility for your group, um, things like, you know, all the social media sources that we talked about earlier, but also video chats. Um, it is, I, I, being someone who's um, 
a near technophobe, um, I um, have been really amazed by, um, by how much the community um, can be built through um, these sort of online um, platforms. Um, and so um, it might be something to, to try out with your group. Um, again, if people have that capacity to do a video chat together before the season begins, maybe, maybe your orientation happens um, and it, you know, on, through using an online platform rather than in person. Um, uh, so just thinking creatively about that, um, again, is what we have to do right now. Um, and I think that there are some good options out there. So I'm going to do, um, this is my, my last slide in this section, so I'm going to do a last um, a stop share and I would just love to hear, like I said, I, I'm still figuring out that piece a lot myself um, in terms of how we still really build community in these spaces and I would love to hear from you how your group will continue to build those connections. Um, in the garden during this unusual season. And, and I know it's, un, it's particularly unusual right now and we're still kind of under the stay at home order. Um, and, but I, even though that, that may change as the season moves on, I think it's, it will continue to be an unusual season um, in terms of how people feel about a lot of this. Um, and so, um, so how do we proceed? Um, and if anybody, I would just love to hear anybody's ideas around that, um, creative ideas or questions or concerns around that um, that anybody has. And again, Don't feel free. In the chat box, but nothing in the chat box. Okay, feel free to raise your hand, and we're happy to unmute you, um, or you can chat. Um, send a chat that says, "I want to speak." If you, if we can't see your face, and I'll give us just a minute to ponder that before I open up for more general questions and and ideas. So a couple, are you seeing the questions pop up? Libby, I see Uta is sharing that she has tons of concerns about how to keep the most vulnerable safe in the garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and as we, as we should. Um, and I think, as, as we mentioned in the guidelines, I think in general, um, uh, the, the, really the advice is the um, stay home if you feel like you, you might be at risk at a high, higher risk than others. Um, so that's a, that's a tough one, right? Because <laughs> that's not an easy thing to say to people and that's not an easy thing to accept if you're in one of those vulnerable populations. Um, that is what we are encouraging right now. Um, however, um, there's some things we can think about around that. So, uh, so one is, you know, a uh, practice that a lot of the community gardens have, you know, if you're going to be gone for a portion of the season or can't make it for the first portion of the season or um, whatever, you know, you're on vacation, um, having having your group sort of take over um, whatever plots, you know, if someone says, oh, yeah, I can't be at the garden, it's not a safe place for me, um, uh, having that communication now, maybe reaching specifically out to those folks now, um, just to say, hey, we're, we're, we realize you might be concerned about this. We'd like to help you in this way. And perhaps it's um, tending their garden or helping to plant it initially before they can start being there in a more safe, um, in a safe manner. Um, obviously that, that spacing that we talked about, um, like Nancy said, at some gardens, it's just not an issue. You can, there's so much space <laughs> um, that, uh, that it can, still can be a really safe um, space for anybody. Um, but, uh, but just making sure you're reaching out and communicating about those things, I think is really important and, and offering some things. So I see Nancy mentions our spring potluck will be held by Zoom this Sunday. All right, I love it. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, my, let's, my biggest concern is kids getting left out because our kids space is not as set up for cleaning. Um, yeah, absolutely. So Nancy, do you want to say anything more about that? Or does that pretty much cover it? Um, we haven't figured out a strategy. You know, parents always bring their kids. We have a wonderful little house and tools and sandbox and things that at this point, we've essentially said we haven't figured that piece out, so it's kind of not allowed, which is just such a huge disappointment. So if anyone out there has great ideas, I don't think, you know, the dirt again is moist. Who knows if virus lives in dirt? Just, you know, all the toys, do you dump them in a bleach bucket? We just, um, 
I'm just really sad because the one of the best things about our community garden is, is the kids space. Just even when it's not your kids that are there, they're just beautiful energy. So that's a, a nut we haven't cracked. Yeah. Any thoughts out there about that? Anybody else have advice for Nancy around kids in the garden and how to still have either have activities or the space to make things happen? So that, that's definitely a curious idea. I mean, I think, yeah, with a lot of these things, it's sort of, um, we're, that, that balancing of how do we keep um, an uplifting environment? <laughs> how do we keep a space that, you know, still keeps that nature, that purpose that we're talking about, that nature of what we're trying to pull off, um, but keeping people safe and, and yeah, that, that balance of when do we just, when do you take something off <laughs> um, and just say, we'll return to this. It's not, you know, no, we're not done with this. We'll return to this. Um, one thing I do wonder is if there are, um, in terms of the, that concept of like take home ideas, um, maybe there's not take home, but like activities that you can do with your kids in the garden space or um, something fun like that, um, that just to help parents think a little bit about um, how to do that uh, could be a fun idea. I know it doesn't, for some parents, they just want to get work done while they're in the garden. It's harder to do sometimes when kids are there, um, but could be, could be a fun thing, fun activities for families in the garden. Cheryl, did you have something you wanted to offer? I see you're unmuted. Thanks. Um, what we've, with the garden group talking on our Google group, we came up with that we're protecting ourselves and we're protecting other gardeners and there's no way to do 100% of either. And so the uh, way we're looking at it is we are aiming our rules and guidelines at three groups. Um, those who are most vulnerable, those who are uh, we don't know how vulnerable, but at least they're still going into stores and taking care, uh, you know, following sensible guidelines as they come out. Um, and the groups we can't control, which might be a gardener who isn't as conscientious, but also the general public who could just wander in and lick everything if they want. So um, we think about this and that means that we need to take steps each ourselves to protect ourselves, but that also protects other people. Um, we did change, and, and Nancy, I hear what you're saying. It sounds like you have a beautiful space there for kids. We've said this year, this season, children are allowed in the garden only if they are gardening and following the rules as an adult. So that's the only way. And one person with a um, very energetic nine-year-old is coming only when other gardeners are not here. And it's working so far quite well. Um, we've also said no pets, like we'd allowed garden friendly cats and dogs who had been coming with gardeners to the garden. And alas, not this time because um, just, no need to explain. Um, there are going to be gardeners who are just too high risk or their household is too high risk to garden to do this at all. Like we had one household drop out completely because they just couldn't wrap their heads around feeling safe doing this. And then it seems like most of the rest of the garden is pretty comfortable with it with varying degrees of feeling at risk themselves even as they're taking all the precautions that they possibly can. Um, Chris and I are not going to be out there with anybody else out there. We do not go into any shared indoor spaces. Um, we don't go to the store. We don't do anything. So other than walking outdoors far, far away from other people. Um, so it's just going to be a range of what works for people. I don't, um, because we're the hosts, we also feel quite responsible for everybody else taking care of themselves and taking care of others and not becoming a place where infection happens. So I, I want to encourage Nancy, especially anybody who wants to um, send stuff, like I'm going to share the gallon of water to a third of a cup of bleach for soaking food to remove pathogens. I think that's wonderful. Um, and, and any of these kinds of tips and as more information comes that could help us garden safely, I'd love to know it. Excellent. Thank you, Cheryl. That's really helpful. Um, and and one thing I actually have heard of um, a few gardens talk about too is if it's possible to close your garden to the general public, um, that this this would be the time to do that potentially. It, it may, it's not possible for all of your gardens. I know that, um, but uh, but something to consider potentially. Um, and, and Enrique, did I see you waving your hand? Yes. Yeah. So. Earlier you said to use five tablespoons of bleach to a gallon of water for uh, 
disinfecting tools, but now we're using a third of a cup to a gallon of water for vegetables. So I'm, is there some discrepancy there about really how that works? The bleach issue is always an interesting issue for me about what really is the safe amount. So I'm gonna unmute Nancy again, um, just because I don't know anything about the- One third? Yeah, um, that was Nancy's advice. And sometimes the unmuting's working and sometimes it's not. <laughs> there you go. You allow me then to unmute myself. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, so the, the protocol tends to be, like I do it with, with uh, if you take a quart of water and you fill it two thirds full, I put a tablespoon in a quart or two thirds of a quart and then I fill it with rags and that's my rag bleach um, thing. So they say four teaspoons per quart and there's uh, you know three teaspoons in a tablespoon and there's four tablespoons in a quarter cup and so you just kind of round it up for a gallon. So essentially for a gallon you need more than a quarter cup in the way that my protocol and what I've been taught and read and shared is four teaspoons for a quart of water. So I'm not sure, did you, did you say that on VC, the garden thing is five tablespoons per, I didn't hear what that ratio was that you were given per five gallon bucket or something, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's five tablespoons per gallon of water. So a third of a cup per gallon of water. And that's from the- I just said, that's exactly what I said. Yeah, so that's, that's from the CDC website. Yeah. For, for disinfecting tools and or, or surfaces. So I think we're saying the same thing. The, the disinfectant, like it. whether it's a tool or a head of lettuce, is the disinfectant concentration of Clorox to water that you need, whether it's tools, whether it's your thing. So I'm not sure, Enrique, if you heard something different, but it's essentially the same ratio, whether you're washing out a tool, a countertop, or soaking ahead of lettuce. Did you feel like you were getting mixed numbers? No, I think that's the clarification I wanted because you hear other people, you know, using bleach to, to wipe off surfaces up to 10% concentration, like, a, like you would to wash pots and planters when you're starting on a new season. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the question with me. Should why do surfaces be at a higher concentration than vegetables? I, I think the point though that is the difference is if you leave something on for a minute, you can have a more dilute concentration. If you want to wipe something down and then touch it 10 seconds later, you use a stronger concentration. If you wipe something down that you can leave for a minute or if you put, and that's why they say two to three minutes. And I say, if you're leaving it in, leave it for three to five minutes. I mean, the bleach, it, 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 there's always a bell-shaped curve and you know 99 percent and if you want to be careful you're always on those outer edges so that's what I say is it's the it's the the stronger it is the less long you need but take the time leave things wet for a minute or leave things in a bleach solution for three to five but I'm sure there's lots of convicted conflicting advice that's the way I think about it okay thank yeah, you and and the CDC is, is a really great resource for a lot of this as well. I mean, we, we got a lot of our information from there. Um, and so they're a great authority on a lot of the, these things. And, um, and actually, I think, I think Brett actually just jumped off, but um, uh, on the UVM page, um, and actually we've linked to it in our guidelines um, where we talk about food safety. We have a link to just, it's kind of like a general, like these are some things you might be thinking about, wanting, wanting to think of, thinking about around food safety if you're sharing your food. So um, yeah, so you can check out those resources too if you want a little bit more background information. Sure. Yep, excellent. Um, so we're, it's just about time for us to start closing up, but I wanted just to give a chance if there were any um, last burning questions or anything that anybody wanted to share um, before we close up. So um, I do see something from um, from Brett before she had to hop off. Um, uh, so they are doing a Q and A with um, with Omar um, Oyarzabal uh, from UVM's food safety food safety expert um, that we will post on our website early next week. 
So if you need any specific questions on food safety for, for Omar, let me know. Um, and it sounds like that's something that you can potentially um, potentially tap into by visiting that same website that I will be featuring and sending to you all. So that's a great resource from Brett from UVM. That's the UVM Extension Master Gardeners. All right, so I'm going to just um, share my screen one more time um, with just a, um, a few resources I want to make mention of, some of which I've already mentioned, um, that COVID-19 resource page. Um, our Garden Organizer Toolkit, I think a number of you have already spent some time, um, some time in there, but if you haven't, um, peruse our website. Um, there are loads of resources, including things that are just very um, based around uh, growing in the garden, learning in the garden, and um, enjoying your produce from the garden, that sort of thing. Um, so I've, I've highlighted that now. Um, some great resources in there that you might want to consider, again, as, you're, as this is the time to kind of keep gardeners engaged. If you can't quite meet at the garden yet, um, maybe you send them something on, hey, here's a great planning tool that you might want to check out. or um, uh, you have questions around uh, different types of gardening and check out these resources. So um, feel free to use um, use those resources on there. They're our favorite resource, our favorite go to resources ourselves. Um, so please, please utilize that. Um, if you're not on our newsletter yet, um, I would highly recommend um, getting on there. Uh, we, we have lots of information throughout the year, um, particularly right now. Um, we're, you know, just paying attention to people's questions, both around just gardening in general, um, but also around concerns around um, COVID-19. So um, updates through our newsletter. And then to continue this conversation, a few things that I would recommend. Um, one is our closed Facebook group. Um, and, uh, and Cheryl, among a few others, are our um, key captains for um, continuing that conversation. Um, but I, I, people are often asking, hey, I want a chance to, to talk to other people about these things outside of, you know, a, a workshop or a webinar. Um, that is a great place to ha make that happen. Um, it's a you know, robust group of people, a lot of people with really wonderful ideas and, and cool things that they're doing. Um, so post your question there. Um, or, um, you know, whether it's what is this bug or whether it's how do you deal with this particular issue in the garden. Um, that's a great place to do that. And then another um, way that we've recently opened up is our um, week, weekly garden chats. So um, we started those last week. Um, they're going to be every Thursday um, at 11 a.m. Not this Thursday, um, but again starting back up next Thursday. I think it's the 30th. Um, and that's, it's, you know, about 45 minutes, depending on how, who shows up and how long people want to hang out and is very informal, um, but a chance to come on and continue this conversation, come with your just gardening questions or, you know, questions like we're discussing here, um, everything is game. Um, so definitely consider that. And then another, um, just continue the conversation resource that I wanted to put out there. Um, the, the, if you're involved in kind of an educational side of things, the School Garden Support Organization Network has an amazing website with webinars and collated resources. They have a wonderful forum that's really um, addressed this, um, this issue and what a lot of schools and other ed educational facilities are dealing with right now. Um, so a really great place to continue that conversation as well. And then before we close up, I just wanted to um, mention I will be sending a follow up email in that email. Um, I will send an evaluation um, and I, I ask that if you could you please um, give us your feedback. Let us know what went well from, in the session, um, what you would like to see more of, um, what didn't go as well and, and then things that we could tweak if we do this again sometime. Um, and, uh, and then I'll also be sending a recording of this webinar once that's ready. It should be ready um, before the end of the day, hopefully. So I'll hopefully be sending all that out to you. The chat log will be on there. So any resources that are shared, you can also access um, through that chat log. And then I'll also send a, a PDF of my slideshow where all those little blue links were. You can, those are live links that you can click on once you get that PDF. And so those resources will all be at your fingertips as well. Um, and then the last thing to mention is if anybody does need a professional development certificate from for today's um, time together, I'm happy to send that to you. Um, just send me an email with your name and any special information you need in there and I will get it your way by the end of the week, hopefully, or next week at the latest. So that's everything from me. Thank you all for taking the time. Um, and yeah, anything else, Carolina, that you wanted to say or things that things that I missed out on? No. Okay. 
All right. Well, thank you all once again and be well. Thank you for everything you do in your communities and, and hope to see you all sometime soon. <laughs> Take care.